Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Park Kusiasari. Coming up in the next 60 minutes. Government secures funds to complete six abandoned hospital projects in the Ashanti region. Also, pupils of Teldom MA Basic School put on first aid medication to treat recurring sores and rashes on their body. And elsewhere on the international front, Iran urges Britain to contain domestic political forces intent on escalating tensions between the two countries. We've got details of these and many more stories coming up in the next 60 minutes. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. We're very active on social media. Our handle is TV3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, the Ghana AIDS Commission has described as alarming the rate of new HIV infections in the country. The commission is worried patients defaulted in taking their antiretroviral medication and others who do not know their status are contributing to the new cases. Some 335,000 people live with HIV in Ghana. In 2018, new infections recorded by the Ghana AIDS Commission stood at 19,931. Although HIV prevalence rate has dropped for the past five years, battling new infections is a major challenge. Acting Director General of the Ghana AIDS Commission, Chermi Etuahine, says some HIV patients have defaulted in taking their antiretroviral medications, leading to increase in their viral loads. Others who do not know their status are also spreading the virus. 2018, 184,955 uh, people knew their HIV status. But of this number, only 113,000 are on treatment, which means we have nearly 72,000 people who know that they have HIV but are not on treatment. We also have many people who have been on treatment but are defaulting. Some of them when they, be, they take the medicines and become well, they think they are okay. Some even believe that they, they, they've been cured. It's not true. The virus is still there. The commission has a target to diagnose 90% of Ghana's population by 2020. Out of the figure, 90% are to be placed on antiretroviral. We are not against herbal medicine. Herbal medicine has its role. Some help in treating the opportunistic infections, but they do not treat HIV. So the virus will multiply in your blood if you continue to skip using antiretroviral medicines. Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osei-Mensa describes the region as vulnerable to infections due to the central location and commercial activities. In 2017, the prevalence rate for the Ashanti region was 3.2% from the 2.6% figure in 2016. In 2017, the region was leading with a 3.2% rate as against the 2.6% in 2016. Currently, there has been a drop to 2.6% in spite of an increase in the national rate from 1.62 to 1.67%. This clearly shows that a lot more work needs to be done. The Ghana AIDS Commission held an orientation workshop for regional committees of the Commission from the Ashanti, Bono, Central and Western regions. Away from that, pupils of Cheldom MA Basic School have been put on first aid medication to treat recurring sores and rashes on their body. Their teacher, who is the school health education program coordinator, is giving them the treatments as they await for official reports from the Ghana Health Service to determine the cause of skin infection. Cheldom is a farming community located in the lower Menyakrobo municipality of the eastern region. Residents live in scattered hamlets. The Chedo Municipal Assembly Basic School 
has an enrollment of 230 from kindergarten to junior high school. Pupils walk long distances, some on barefoot and others on shoes donated by benefactors. Their source of water is untreated well and a borehole. School authorities see the water before it is used by pupils. But some pupils fear the continuous use of the water from the untreated well may have adverse effects on them. Our colleagues, when they drink it, they get skin diseases. And we also, because we don't have anything to do about it, when we are also drinking it, we are thinking that we also get the disease. Um, we don't have clean water to drink, and if we drink the water too, we get some effect from the water. Some is diarrhea. Some people are said to have complained of stomach problems before the source were discovered by their teacher, Frederick Nati, who also has a school health education program. Realize that these days when the children come to school, they have a lot of sores on them. And the first aid provision was only based on maybe their stomach upset, the headache. Uh -huh. So when I started seeing the sores on them, I said, oh, I can do something. So I've been asking some health personnel how we can assist children with sores. Under the school health education program, teachers are trained to care for the basic health care needs of people during their stay in school. He explained efforts to treat the reoccurring skin infections and sores is proving difficult, causing him to report to his municipal directors for assistance two weeks ago. People's numbering 15 are currently undergoing first aid treatments plan as they wait for official reports on cause of infection. First, you have to dress the sore well before you apply the medicine. So we use hydrogen peroxide, which cleans the wound. And then later, we use the dress on it. And also, if the sore comes as a result of rashes, then we use the penicillin ointment on it. Now, oozes the water out of the sore faster. Yilo Krobo, Municipal Assembly Deputy Director of Education, Agnes Atipo, was hopeful by Monday, official reports on blood samples taken by the health service personnel would reveal the real cause of the infection. Now, government has secured funds to complete six abandoned hospital projects in the Ashanti region. During a tour of the facilities, Health Minister Kwekwajiman Menu noted the projects are expected to be operational by December 2020. Work on the six hospitals located at Tepa, Konongo, Kumewu, Formina, Sewa and Bakwai were halted between a period of three to seven years. The health ministry has attributed the situation to litigation and alleged misappropriation of funds. Health Minister Kwekua Jumamenu says the obstacles hindering the commencement of work have been resolved. He hinted that all the facilities will be operational latest by December 2020. Work has actually started on the three in Ashanti region. We are anticipating that these three big hospitals will be completed before December 2020. At Tepa, contractors have resumed work on the 60-bed district hospital. The facility is currently 80% complete and expected to be operational by March 2020. Contractors have also moved to site at the 60-bed Konongo Hospital, which is about 60% complete. The facility is expected to be handed over before September 2020. The 120-bed Kumewu District Hospital has been left at the mercy of the weather. Some of the structures have started deteriorating due to neglect. The situation is the same at the 150-bed Formina District Hospital. The facility has been taken over by weeds, but the minister assured that contractors would be on site by August. The 250-bed regional hospital cited in Zewa has been scheduled to be completed by December 2020. A loan of 22 million euros has been secured to complete the Bekwai Hospital to be handed over by November 2020. Kwekwa Jima Menu expressed government resolve to complete all uncompleted projects, including the 40-year-old Konfanochi Teaching Hospital Maternity Block. We have actually procured a contractor, fund money, and work is just about to commence. We will soon come and do sword cutting at Konfanochi. The projects are expected to boost healthcare delivery in the region and also reduce pressure at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. 
Now, tons of non-compostable sanitary pads make its way into sewage systems, landfills and fields, as well as water bodies, posing huge environmental and health risks. Safe technologies and interventions to dispose of or treat menstrual waste are non-existent in Ghana. My colleague Adrado Biawusu has more in this report. The days when our grandmothers in their youthful age used cloth as sanitary pads are past. Sanitary pads are a monthly requirement of girls and women worldwide. Despite its inaccessibility by some young girls, particularly in some rural communities, there is an estimated 113,000 tons of menstrual waste annually. Statistics from the Ghana Statistical Service show that there are about 6 million girls and women between the ages of 14 to 54. Out of this, 50% of them either do not experience menstruation at all or do not have access to sanitary materials with some using other forms of sanitary materials like the menstrual cup. If one of these persons use two parts each day, that means that we are going to have one person using 10 parts each month, making 120 every year. If we have 3 million of these girls or women using sanitary parts, it means we are going to have 360 million parts used annually. But the question is, where are these parts disposed of? I, I normally put it in the water cream, so that something doesn't go. So when it doesn't go, what do you do? I just remove it and I put it in the dustbin. I used tea to wrap it first, then I used polythene bag again to wrap it again, then I just dispose it to the rubbish dump. You will take one part, then you will fold it, then you will put it in the takeaway rub and trust it in the dustbin. That means that 360 million parts multiplied by 800 years is going to give us 288 billion years which is actually more than the world's existence of 4.543 billion years. Worse still is that most sanitary parts are plastic-based and non-biodegradable and could take between 500 and 800 years to decompose. This means the sanitary parts we tossed in the bin will continue to be retained in the ecosystem after you and I are long gone. Data provided by waste landfills indicates that menstrual waste collected across the country, primarily consisting of sanitary pads, are disposed of as routine waste along with household garbage. Well, one way of effectively dealing with sanitary um, products like this would be incineration. But this would have to be done at very, very high temperatures around 800 degrees Celsius. But unfortunately, we do not have those facilities available. So what happens now is that for safe disposal, it, it goes to the final disposal site, that's the landfills. He explains the required machinery to segregate sanitary parts is unavailable while its burning produces toxic fumes. Once they end up in the soil, what is going to happen is that they are going to, the chemical is going to bind with the microflora of the soil and prevent decomposition. So they are going to be in the, in the ground for a very long time. The water can wash this to the sea. Remember, fishes are going to feed on it. Okay? And it's going to affect the life of the fishes as well as also serve as a, a danger to those of us who, who, who feed on the fishes as well. In addition, the longer used parts are kept in the open and get into contact with air, the more they become pathogenic and cause viral and bacterial infections. Moreover, biodegradable sanitary pads made of natural products like banana or jute fiber take not more than three months to decompose. Even if to decompose, it takes only three months to decompose. Meanwhile, the other ones will take more than 500 years to decompose, and that's already environmental hazard. So we came out with uh, ours, which is easy to dispose because in rural areas you can throw it in the latrine, you can just dig the soil and bury it in, in three months you are good to go in the environment. And beside that also, the extraction of the fiber, the waste extraction of the fiber is already an organic manure already. You turn that to organic manure, which is already good for the soil fertility and for the community at large. As part of solving waste management challenges, it is imperative that all forms of waste be considered. 
Residents of Alugboshi in the Greater Accra region have resorted to dumping of waste on the Accra and Sawam railway line. A large portion of the railway line has been covered with filth. My colleague Josephine Armstrong, Joseph Armstrong, I beg your pardon, uh, visited the area and has come through with this report. The railway looks attractive and well arranged from a distance, but getting closer, it tells a painful story of how residents, mainly squatters living close to the rail lines, have resorted to dumping of refuse on the newly worked on Accra and Sawam rail line. The residents see nothing wrong with the dumping of refuse here. It's not for free. We pay one CD each for Bella, for uh, rubbish. So an uh, uh, old man used to sit over here, then he used to collect the money from us. I know get that, so I'm supposed to dump this over here. If I get that from my house, I won't dump my ball over here. Ghanaians, if I get that from my house, I won't dump ball over here. I'm a grand pay tax, so they're supposed to supply so, so that in my house, in my community, in my district. We are the baller now. We are the baller now. We are the baller now. We are the baller we don't have any place to dump our refuse. From Alogoshi all the way to Achimota has become our dumping site. As part of TV3 sanitation campaign, I made a formal complaint to the municipal chief executive of Okainkwe North, Boilai. He later followed me together with his district directors to Alogoshi. We were later joined by the assemblyman of the area. The municipal chief executive, upon seeing the mess created along the railway lines, became upset and furious. No, then we need to come and do some. Yeah, uh -huh. we need yeah, yeah, we need to apply a barcode. Kuni eba clear bear how. When I was uh, appointed, uh, I visited a lot of places. Um, I remember we came here, but the situation wasn't as bad as um, I'm seeing this morning. And uh, I'm very overwhelmed about what I'm seeing here because it's very sad and very pathetic. He promised to have the refuse collected within two weeks. Ministry of Railways, um, this is their track or whatever. And they know that this thing was going on because they apply the road all the time. So they could have you know, been proactive to alert the, you know, our mother assembly, that's AMA. We'll give ourselves some two weeks to be able to do that. So we are starting this Saturday. But what will happen to squatters who dumped refuse along the rail line? We will arrest anyone found dumping refuse here. The resident had earlier accused the assemblyman for the area of collecting money to allow them dump refuse here. But the assemblyman refuted the allegations. To take money to dump here as an assemblyman. Mm. Honestly, a local government need to make me resign as an assemblyman. Why should I even do this in the first place? Mm. No, I swear an oath to carry the job. When you do this, it will be a curse on you. Assemblyman, I will never do this. Joseph Armstrong Gold, TV3, Alubushi, Accra. And we'll be following up on the story to bring you the very latest developments on it. You're still watching Media Life here on TV3. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. If you've got uh, any comments or views or suggestions to share with us in, on any of our top stories, be it our sanitation campaign, you can feel free to send your views and comments to any of our social media pages, TV3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. Let's do some politics now, and the National Democratic Congress Parliamentary Primaries is on. And the Dadeko Topong constituency, the former municipal chief executive of the area, has filed her nomination form to contest. Rita Odole Soa promised to help recapture the seat for the National Democratic Congress if voted to lead the party. Here's a report by my colleague uh, Frederick Clarence Williams. The former municipal chief executive of La Dadikotopon, Rita Odole Sowa, was accompanied by teaming supporters. They went through some principal streets of La amid drumming and dancing to reaffirm their support for Rita Odole Sowa. She was welcomed by constituency executives of the party. The first time parliamentary aspirant said she will ensure the party's peace and democratic principles are strictly adhered to. I want the people to know one thing. The projects don't just come, but you need to have lobbying skills to ensure that you lobby for the projects to come on board. You, you realize that some districts don't have anything thing done because if you don't have the lobbying skills, you cannot get it done. Rita Odole Sowa urged supporters to remain committed to the NDC, assuring she'll work to recapture the seat. 
She promised to prosecute a clean campaign devoid of mud sliding and asked the delegates to give her the mandate to lead a party in the constituency. My arms are wide open and I want them to come so that we all work together, we hold our hands together, we lean on each other to make sure that we are taking the seat back from the MPP in Lada de Cotopon. Four candidates have so far filed the nomination forms to contest the primaries in the La Dadikotopong constituency for the NDC. At the Pong Katamansu constituency, four persons out of five aspirants have filed to contest the primaries. Party sympathizers trooped to the party office to show solidarity to the three-time contestant, Captain Moses Tetelanyo. He promised selfless, truthful and transparent leadership if given the nod. I will not become an MP because of NDC. No, no way. I keep saying it every day that our nation Ghana is bigger and is better than almost all nations that I have visited. Ghana must always win in all our agendas. I wouldn't go to the Parliament House and if policies have been brought on board by the NDC, which are not good for our nation because I'm wearing NDC colors, I will say yes, it's good. No. What is not good for our country is not good for our country. The incumbent MP, Nilaya Fotagbo, after winning the seat in 2004, has decided to say goodbye to politics. Still ahead in the bulletin, we've got the very latest in business news. We've got sports and international news all coming up. you welcome back to Media Life here on TV3. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. Now, leader of the United People's Party, Akwesi Adai Odike, says Ghana needs drastic economic measures to overcome the country's debt accumulation. Akwesi Adai expects the finance ministry to do more in debt management while expanding the economy for the country to be able to repay its debt. Akwesia Dei Odike was responding to the latest debt sustainability analysis reports by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Ghana's risk of external and overall debt distress continued to be assessed as high per the analysis. The World Bank and IMF maintained that a downward trend in the total public debt to GDP ratio was interrupted in 2018 as a result of the realization of significant contingent liabilities in the banking sector. Businessman and leader of the United People's Party, Akwesia Dei Odike, who spoke to TV3 News in Kumase after the release of the report, urged government to do more to improve revenue mobilization. Uh, any serious government will look out for um, export possibilities. And it, it, it is one of the cautions the IMF also brought out that if we don't export more, we, uh, there's possible we go back to IMF. Excessive uh, um, um, government borrowing. The borrowings are not used for um, 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 adventureships that we can recoup our uh, investment and pay back the loans. Akosia Day believes the situation could impact negatively on the costs of borrowing. The U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs under the S. Well Obama administration, Linda Thomas Greenfield, has commended President Akufado for pursuing the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda. She says that is the surest way to guarantee long-term development. She was speaking to TV3's Alfredo Kanse in Madison, Wisconsin. President Akufado launched the Ghana Beyond Aid Charter at the 2019 May Day celebration. Upon the assumption of office on 7th of January 2017, President Kufado espoused his government's desire to prudently manage the country's natural resources in a manner that would allow the country's development agenda to be financed without recourse to external assistance. An agenda the President referred to as building a Ghana beyond aid. Commenting on the possibility of a Ghana beyond aid on the sidelines of a meeting on strengthening institutions in Africa Ongoing in Wisconsin, United States of America, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs under the ex Obama administration, Linda Thomas Greenfield, commended President Kofado for the agenda. She is of the view that the best way to guarantee a more sustainable growth for any country on the continent is trade, not aid. You cannot upgrade 
uh, stability with, uh, with aid. And we've seen that development assistance, while it's good and it's useful, it doesn't have the long-term benefits that people expect uh, from uh, the countries to achieve. So it is only through through investments, uh, jobs are created. It's only through business that jobs are created. And I think uh, the president uh, has something that other countries are seeing can be beneficial to their future. She was, however, worried that the fight against corruption was not yielding the expected results, a situation, she says, could erode all the gains of a Ghana beyond aid. Uh, it's really important uh, that corruption be dealt with if we're going to see successful investments in, in, in a country. And I think Ghana has started the process of setting that uh, stage, but a lot more work needs to be done. Although Ghana receives less aid, than many other countries. It is still supported by bilateral donations from the likes of the European Union, France, Denmark, and other organizations such as the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the US Aid Agency, amongst others. The conversations here so far has been about how Africa can sustain its development agenda through effective structures and systems of accountability and also to ensure that corruption is checked because there can never be any sustainable development without accountability. From the University of Wisconsin-Madison, my name is Alfredo Kansi for TV3 News. In other news, the bulk oil storage and transportation company Limited Boss has hinted the company will begin the automation of its depot management by the end of the year to improve efficiency and eliminate losses. The head of corporate communications and external affairs, Malik Ajay, noted the depot management has to be temporarily uh, outsourced during the period of the automation process. In 2009, bulk oil distribution companies, BDCs, were allowed by BOSS to store their products in BOSS tanks across the country. From 2009 to 2013, due to porous system inventory and controls at the depots, BOSS lost 25.2 million liters of petrol and diesel, amounting to $33 million at that time. As a measure against the losses to BOSS, Former managing director of the company, Kinsley Kwame Uwadakun, contracted TSL to manage the depots from 2014. Head of Corporate Communications and External Affairs, Malik Ejay, observed since TSL came into the system, BOST has not recorded any losses. We take the risk of product losses from ourselves as a company and laid it at the doorstep of TSL. The inclusion of TSL in the equation has resulted in some product gains and we think it is a good way to go. TSL's contract, which was to end in March, was extended to December this year to prevent any losses to bust. Malik Ajay hinted to avoid the human discretion and interference, which resulted in the losses which bust is still struggling to pay the BDCs. The company will start automation of the entire depot management system by end of the year and be completed within 16 to 20 months. BOST has advertised for depot management companies to apply for managing the depots from January 2020 until the computerization process is completed and the management reverted to BOST staff who are being trained. TSL was charging about $600,000 a month for the management of the depots. And when we pressed on, we got a negotiated amount of about $300,000, which we still think is on the higher side. Going forward, when we successfully come to the end of the competitive bidding that we are instituting, we hope to beat the rates down further and to eliminate it completely after the automation. A research and policy analyst at Institute for Energy Security IES Megdad Mohammed gave the breakdown of bust losses from 2009 to 2013. About 74 million uh, Ghana cities worth of products were, were, were unaccounted for within the system. Uh, that is about 10 million in 2010, about 14.3 uh, million in 2011. In 2013 itself, about 45 million uh, worth of products were unaccounted for, which has been subjects of audits. He noted the bulk oil storage and transportation company limited has to go beyond the automation 
to ensure effective implementation. They must have the right people with the right mindset and skills to run the system. Lest we have an automated system which is managed by people who hate the automation because the automation makes it impossible for them to cheat the system. BOST, since 1993, has been responsible for strategic storage of fuel and transportation of same across the country for efficiency and better running of the economy in terms of fuel requirements. Well, that's all for the very latest in business news. We'll take a short break and return with the very latest in sports. Well, let's do some other stories now. An spirited performance from Senegal and Mali saw the two West African nations beat competition from 16 nations, including host Ghana and the U.S. in the fourth Pan-African robotic competition. The four-day competition saw participating countries compete in four different technologies. My colleague Peter Kwaodato sat through the exciting challenge and has come through with this following report. The Pan-African Robotics Competition, PARC, is an all-African robotics competition created to inspire the youth while promoting STEM education in Africa. Challenges are based on real-world topics relevant to science, technology and the sustainable development of Africa. The fourth edition in Accra attracted 42 teams from 18 countries, up from seven countries in 2017. Participating students competed in one of four leagues, techs for middle school aged between 11 and 15, stars and makers for high school aged between 15 and 19, and engineers for university graduates aged 19 years and above. Each team was to devise solutions for the planning, design, management and transformation of future African cities in an increasingly complex urban environment. Participating teams work on their robots and projects in advance and bring their final design to compete in Accra. Techs and Stars League students are given kits to build and code a robot that meets the challenge requirements. Teams use their robots to compete and play in the 2019 Challenge Games. Makers and Engineers League students researched and created a model or phototype that solves the challenge scenarios. Makers and Engineers League students researched and created a model or phototype that solves the challenge scenarios. There were all female teams from Lesotho and Liberia who, along with Team USA, could not do well in the competition. The rationale is to create uh, great engineers, uh, Africans that are able to participate in the world of technology, to create products, to be leaders, uh, so that the African continent is a, is a producer and a prosperous continent like every other continent. The event was highly competitive from the first to the last day. Senegal and Mali emerged the top two competitors, having picked wins in three of the four leagues each. Djibouti won in two leagues, while Ghana, the Gambia, Zimbabwe and Nigeria won in one league each. Making it to the fourth position, I mean, it's really a big um, honor for us. And given the fact that this is our first time competing in the park, uh, we really uh, feel happy um, winning and um, again the preparation was really tedious but alhamdulillah we were able to make it through. An associate professor at the Mechanical and Materials Engineering Department, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, USA and founder of the Pan-African Robotic Competition, Professor Sidi Ndao, was delighted over the turnout. Time has come that we paint a different image of the continent. An image of prosperity over desperation. An image of unity over conflict. An image of scientific and technological innovation over simply consumerism. An image of world leadership over so-called third world. These past few days have shown that this image of the continent is within our reach. Director responsible for training in STEM and robotics, National Collaborative Center for Education in Robotics, University of Kabbalah, 
Bamako, Mali, Michael Leventhal, leaves. Africa has a great future if resources are put at the disposal of the youth. There's not been the, the emphasis, the financing that it needs. So um, there are some intentions there. Now we have to put it into action. The 2019 PARC competition was coordinated by Fatima Kebe. Even though some of the projects not feasible technically, the fact that it's in the students' minds is step one. That's all it takes for us to actually continue to develop as a society, continue to think outside of the box. I think Africa in general has like an amazing future with these students and they have amazing supporters like their coaches, the sponsors, the committee members. The event was on the theme, Solvable Challenges, the Making of African Smart Cities. If you just tuned in, you're watching Media Live here on TV3. Now, an ongoing study by civil society groups is blaming Ghana's decline in academic performance on television and social media. Now, speakers at a, health, at a school health program at the West Africa Senior High School say the inappropriate use of new technologies is disturbing the quality of education. The emergence of technology is seen as a plus to the way of life. In the same vein, the medium has side effects. Apart from cybercrime, which is a major threat in Ghana and the world, it is emerging that over-dependent on these new technologies is a contributory factor to poor education in the country. Studies have shown that spending too much time watching television and on social media with mobile phones have side effects affecting academic performance of many youth. Now the television is not just a box you will watch, they put it in your hand in the name of mobile phone. And some of you spend more time watching your mobile phones and television than the combined hours you spend studying your books. What that means is that you don't have a future as a student. It doesn't matter the amount of anointing oil they pour on your head. If you are not living like a student, you don't have a future as a student. Speaking at a school health education program at the West Africa Senior High School at Adentan near Accra, head pastor of Kingdom Expression, South Oyarifa, William Bexon, insisted parents must take interest in what their wards do with phones and how long they stay glued to their televisions. Just give the gadgets to the children without helping them um, know how to use it effectively will be chaotic for us. Uh, I think we're sowing something we wouldn't want to reap in the future. So the key will be to empower them, to let them know that this tool in their hand, as powerful as it is, uh, can have both negative or positive ramifications on their lives. He insisted children must be guided to adopt academic-related programs on television and on mobile devices to help enhance their learning. Spending time to talk to them about the positive use of this gadget, plus having a certain framework. So, for example, parents must um, let children know screen times. So we know that maybe, okay, from Monday to Friday, um, no screen time. Or you can only have one hour screen time in a day. Maybe after you've done your homework from school, you have an hour screen time. Or after eating, you have an hour screen time, and then you can go to bed. The health education program was geared towards educating girls on reproductive health and other related conditions. We've realized that usually these kind of mentorship programs are done in the university, but we want to start very early so that we can inculcate that habit of people getting guided in school, then when they come out, they can become better people in the society. The program was first of a series of senior high school outreach and was on the theme addressing menstrual concerns what is normal and what is not. Now, 43 ladies have been shortlisted after weeks of competitive auditioning across the country in TV3's cultural rented reality show, Ghana's Most Beautiful, that's GMB. Well, they'll undergo two days of intensive medical screening, after which 16 finalists will be announced to represent their regions. Oh, 
The ladies were put together after being chosen after the Accra, Tamale, Kumasi and Takade auditions in Accra for the final stage. The two-day final audition saw the ladies taken through question and answer session, catwalk session and finally being made to undertake and exhibit their talent. Oh God, I knew it. <laughs> when this driver entered the car, I smelled alcohol when I said it. The rest of the passengers were saying that if he drinks or he had drunk alcohol, how does it affect my pockets? Now look at me. <laughs> this drunk driving man stop. But where is the people of Bota in our quest for freedom? <laughs> in our quest for liberation. A beautiful dance with bed. After going through all the audition processes, 43 ladies were selected for the next stage. For well, the first three, this is where we part ways with you. My congratulations. The 43 comprises of three each from 13 regions, two from the Bono East and one each from the Savannah NOT region. Producers of the show say the basis behind picking more than one contestant for the medicals is to make provision for the emergencies such as when some pull out of the competition on health grounds. They will go through two days of intensive medical screening after which 16 finalists will be announced to represent their regions in the coming weeks. Some of the ladies could not hide the excitement. I happen to be a part of the top three selected and I'm hoping for the best and hoping to represent the central region of Ghana. I know it's just by God's grace and I, I just hope everything turns out good. It just it just started with a decision and now we're here. We just thank God. I'm so excited. I thank you TV3. Thank you everybody. I just keep praying and hoping that I will be the best and selected to represent the Upper East region. So Upper East region, watch out for me. GMB 2019, Black and Proud. Uh, they are black and proud just like we are. That's all for Midday Life here on TV3. Thanks very much for watching. For more news, you can log on to our website www.3news.com. Have a great day.